But I just wanted to bring you into this morning by emphasizing something that I said last Wednesday. And uh, I had entitled that, Lighting the Fire of Your Faith. Uh, get your faith back on fire again. A lot of Christians have let their faith kind of dwindle down and smolder. Uh, and, and I said uh, that God wants you now and this next year to be a light of accelerated manifestation to people around you. That's what the Lord told me to tell you. And also he said, if you'll light up the fire of your faith, you'll burn away every obstacle of defeat. Does anybody in here want defeat just out of your life? No. Nope. Everybody, of course. It'll catapult you into the supernatural realm of superabundant supply. Anybody in here does not want superabundant supply? No hands. But you've got to speak it. I like what Hannah said. <laughs> she was <laughs> praying that, that sweet prayer, you know, and so forth. And, and she said, and Lord, tell them to watch their mouth. <laughs> I'm thinking, that, that's good. That's good. She just kind of put that in there, you know, just kind of scooted it in there. That was good. I like that. But uh, faith is the God connector. And uh, I have dedicated my life because the Lord called me to preach and teach faith. This is what I do. And I've been doing it now since 1978. I don't know how many years that is, but it's a few. And uh, I'll do it until Jesus comes back because this is what I've been assigned to do. And uh, uh, faith, you can't do anything without it. You've got to realize, and, and I, I'm, I'm believing this morning you will really realize the depth of the emphasis you need to place on your faith. I mean, that, that, that's it. That's, that's what it's all about. Amen. Uh, Romans 10, 17, you're familiar with this area of Scripture, says, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Have you ever looked up the word faith in that sentence? It's the same all throughout the New Testament, but here's what it means. Persuasion, that's the first definition. So then persuasion comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You're persuaded to believe what God said by hearing it. And the more you hear it, the more you're persuaded. And if you'll speak it out of your mouth, you'll even become more persuaded because you're hearing yourself say it. And you know, it's just a natural thing. You're going to believe what you say before you believe what anybody else says. Isn't that true? Well, of course it is. People say something to you and you say, well, I don't believe that. This is what I believe. You're going to believe what you believe before you believe what somebody else believes. So if you want to believe what God believes, then you've got to speak what he said. Amen. Simple concept, but very deep. And if you've heard the word, then faith is coming. Amen. Amen. It also, faith also means truth. It means assurance. So assurance comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It means conviction of the truth. So conviction of the truth comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Uh, it means to believe that God exists and that he creates and rules all things and is your provider and bestower of eternal salvation through uh, Christ Jesus, the Messiah, through whom we obtain eternal salvation in the kingdom of God. That comes from hearing the word of God. You believe that. That's what that word faith there means. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8 tells us it's for by grace you have been saved through faith. We taught a whole series not too long ago that you access grace by faith. You know, there's a vault called grace that has all the benefits of the kingdom of God in it, but you can't get in there without the, the key of faith. That accesses you to everything that God's made available. See, all you did was to believe what you heard. That's all it requires you to do. But if you don't hear it, you can't believe it. Amen. That's why a lot of Christians are 30, 60, 100, even in this church. 
There are Christians in here that have strong faith. And then there are Christians in here just have a little dinky wink faith. They show up every once in a while, once a month. Every once in a while, do their duty and show up. And then, you know, they get upset when people get blessed. They look at and, and see people get blessed. Well, you can get blessed just like anybody else gets blessed if you put, you put the time into it. Amen. God's no respecter of persons. I'm not fussing at people this morning. I'm just telling the truth. Amen. You don't get mad at me. Talk to God. He wrote the book. I'm just, I'm just saying what he said. That's all I'm doing. So all you did was to believe what you heard. Well, how, how did you believe the persuasive spiritual force of faith? We just read about it. Faith is a persuasive spiritual force. Do you ever think of it that way? It is a creative force of God, but it's also persuasive. Amen. Have you ever been persuaded to believe something when you saw somebody with strong faith? Say, man, I, I, I need to, I, I want to believe that. Well, you just keep hearing them, keep listening to them. It says that we're to imitate those who, uh, by faith and patience, have inherited the promises. Amen. That's why I looked up, I look up to men and women who are walking in prosperity, who are walking in abundance, who are walking in health, who are walking in all these things that God says are ours. I, I look up to them and I, I try to imitate them so that I can inherit what they've inherited. Amen. I, I don't want what they have. I want the same kind of things that they have because I can have it too. Amen. A lot of people have fussed about uh, my mentor, Kenneth Copeland. He, he has all that much. Some, I just read a, uh, I, I get a report from the ministry because we're partners with it, of the financial status of the church. And uh, Brother Copeland has a personal net worth of $750 million. He's almost a billionaire. Some say, wow, I don't know. Well, that preacher, he, he just. No, you do what he's done, you can get what he's got. Have you given away 35 planes yet? Have you given away 15 houses yet? Then don't be fussing about his wealth. He can't help it. <laughs> he just believes what the word says. Amen. Amen. Well, I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but that was good anyway. So all you did was believe what you heard, and it birthed an action in you to accept Christ Jesus. That's how you received Jesus. You heard that you needed him, didn't you? You heard what he was about, what he did, and you believed that. You heard it to the extent. Now, I heard it probably for a number of years before I decided to believe it. Because I, was, I, I wasn't raised up in the church, but I was raised up around the church. And, you know, my mom and dad, I remember when we were little, they'd say to her that we went to church. You know, and, and then they kind of got lax with it when I got in high school then I, I made it a point to go myself, you know. And, and they may drop me off before I was able to drive, but they would see to it that I got there because they knew that you needed that. And uh, you know, it's, a, it's a long story on why they didn't come. If one thing, they weren't saved. If they had come, they'd gotten saved. But they did end up getting saved. Amen. Uh, so that's the most powerful force that there is, faith. And it penetrates See, what, what it does, it, it penetrates the toughest natural forces. Man's reasoning and his will to remain the same. You know that's true. Before you got saved, I remember when I, I'll just use myself as an example. Before I got saved, I said, I don't, I, I'm all right. I'm okay. My deal was somebody would witness to me about Jesus, you know. And I said, well, I'm all right. I'm going to do that one of these days. Well, one of these days might not come. <laughs> I know a lady when we went to a church when we first came down here she was sitting right behind us in church and the pastor was talking about salvation you need to receive Jesus and it came out of her mouth oh I don't need him I ain't got time for that right now I'll, I'll do it I'm going to but I'll do it later she's telling the friends she was sitting next to well we got in our car after church and we went down the Northwoods Mall and she went through an intersection somebody didn't stop and hit her broadside killed her right after church and it just broke my heart because I heard what she said. And I knew she wasn't saved. Beautiful young lady. Could have been. She turned down the message. Amen. Don't ever turn it down. God has it for you for a special reason. Don't remain the same. Let faith change you. If we just stop and think about just how powerful faith is. 
we would be more willing to flow with it. Did you hear what I said? If you just think about how powerful it is. I mean, it created everything you can see and can't see. That's a pretty powerful force, isn't it? Amen. Don't you agree the earth is a pretty, pretty big place? And it's not even one of the big, big planets. But God created that with faith. Amen. Hebrews 11.3 says, By faith, the worlds were framed by the word of God. He spoke the word and the earth was formed. An invisible but very real force. That's what they call faith. An invisible but real. See, you may not be able to see it, but it's still real. Amen? How many have ever seen their brain? Well, for most people, I think you got one. Some I question. But you got one. Amen. There are some proofs that it exists, but you've never seen it. So I, I, I brought up that argument one time because somebody says, well, I'm not going to believe anything I, I can't see. We were talking about faith. I said, well, have you ever seen your brain? It just kind of came out of my mouth. Have you ever seen your brain? They said, well, no. I said, you believe you got one? <laughs> Yeah, it was kind of sad because I don't think he was real sure. <laughs> but Hebrews 11.6 goes on to tell us that it takes faith to please God. And it goes on, I'm just paraphrasing, by believing that he exists and that he exists to reward us who are sold out to him. It says diligently seek him and sold out to him. So he... Uh, to please God, you've got to believe that he exists and that he exists to reward you because you're sold out to him. Well, that'll give you good motivation to get sold out to him right there. I mean, if nothing else did. See, faith can do anything. Whether you believe that right now or not, say this with me. Faith can do anything. Faith. I've heard some preachers say, oh, faith can't do everything. Yes, it can. It can do anything. And it'll come faster if you hear your own voice confess, confess the word of God. It'll, it'll come faster. But faith can supernaturally cancel a loan. Did you know that? It can heal a marriage. When nothing else has worked, faith will do it. It can find you a job. Oh, yeah. So, see, faith can do things. It can do anything that you'll trust God in his word and, and, and step out on it. it. It can do anything. Why? Because faith doesn't find a solution. Faith creates one. It's a creative force of God. It doesn't go around looking for the answers. It creates the answer. See, if there's something that doesn't exist that needs to exist, God will create it. But he does it by faith and you speaking those words. See, that's, he's working through you now. You're his agent in the earth now. Amen. See, Romans 4.16, we've read this and taught on this so much. And the Amplified Translation tells us that qualifying for the blessing is the outcome or result of faith. It says inheriting the promise. Well, that's qualifying for the blessing. It says that it's the outcome or result of faith and depends entirely on faith so that grace or the blessing or God's ability, there's really synonymous, ter synonymous terms, may be accessed. But it's accessed through faith. We taught on that. See, faith releases the blessing. In fact, that's the title if you're taking notes today. Faith releases the blessing or uh, God's ability or grace. Synonymous terms. Your faith releases that. It's there. It's available. But you have to access it or get it released into your life by believing God. Amen. Amen. Uh, everything that God has already prepared you 
for you before time was. Faith accesses that. So that you can walk in the supply of the good life now. I heard Elder Stan say, you know, we, we can be blessed now. See, I'm not going to need the good life in heaven because it'll be the perfect life. It'll be way beyond good. It'll be the perfect life. I need the good life here. Amen. Amen. You know, you need rent paid here. You need groceries paid for here. You need, you need clothes here. See, we need, we need the good life here. Amen. Houses and property and whatever, whatever it takes for you to live the good life, God's got it prepared for you if you believe Him. And you can have it right now in this life. 1 John 5.15 tells us, and I'll paraphrase that too, that when we go to God fully persuaded that He will answer our word prayers, and I qualify it that way, word prayers He'll answer. He won't answer non-word prayers. He doesn't even hear them. But it tells us that when we go to God fully persuaded that He will answer our word prayers, it goes on to say, we can know with settled and absolute knowledge that we have granted us as our present possession. Say with me, present possession. The request made of Him. That's about as clear as it gets. I'm telling you that we serve an awesome God. Amen. Look at somebody and say, we serve an awesome God. Listen, if, if you heard the word, faith has come. Now, we've, we've taught the word so far this morning. And if you grab hold of what we've taught so far, you'll notice that your faith is growing. If you've grabbed it. Now, if you're sitting there and well, I don't, I don't believe all that. You know, I'm, I've been a Christian for 35 years and I'm not walking in any of that stuff, so it must not be true. No, whether you're walking in it or not doesn't, doesn't have anything to do with whether it's true. If you're walking in it, it's working for you. I know, I know Christians that have been Christians for 40 years. I know pastors that have been Christians for 40 years. And they don't know the Bible. I was in a, I was in a, a, a pastor's meeting just here in Somerville. I was in a pastor's meeting. And they asked me one morning because a person that normally would bring a devotion that they had scheduled, they didn't have a devotion. And they were in a panic because nobody had a devotion. And they said, uh, uh, Reverend Moore, I like that, Reverend Moore, would you, we don't want to put you on the spot, but could you bring us a devotion? I said, sure. They said, do you need a Bible? I said, no, I got a Bible, but I don't need it. I, I don't need it. I said Ephesians 3.20 says that God is able to do abundantly, exceedingly, far above anything you ask or think according to the power that is at work within you. And one, one of those guys, he'd been, he'd been a, a pastoring for almost 50 years. He said, my God, is that in the Bible? <laughs> I said, yeah, Ephesians 3.20. Ephesians 3.20. God is able. And so I talked to him about 10 minutes about how God's able to do for them what they need for him to do according to the power of that anointing to destroy yokes and remove burdens is, is, that is at work within them. Amen. It's at work within you, but you have to hook your faith up to it to access it and receive the benefits of it. Takes faith. Somebody yell out, it takes faith. It takes faith. <laughs> so if you've heard the word, faith has come. Now, there's some things that the devil does. One, one thing he does is he doesn't want you to have faith. So he doesn't want you to hear the word of God because he knows if you hear the word of God, then faith will come. He knows that. He doesn't understand it, but he knows it. And then second thing, or another thing, if you do hear it, he doesn't want you to act on it. Why? Well, because he knows that you can't store faith. Why? No, you can't store it. You got to either use it or you'll lose it. See, we're leaky vessels. If we were perfect, we wouldn't be leaky, but we're not. 
And so you have, to, you have to keep filling yourself up. That's why one devotion a week is not going to cut it for you. You got to pray daily. You got to spend time with the Lord daily. And I'm not talking about hours and hours and hours. I'm talking about time. Set aside. Yeah, I, I, just don't have, I just don't have that kind of time. Pastor, you eat, don't you? You set time to eat. You set time to sleep. You certainly set time to, to sit there on that iPhone and go through Facebook and YouTube and all that. You, you have time for that. Yeah, you got time to do it. Your priorities are out of order. That's all. Not talking to anybody in here, but you need to give this message to somebody that doesn't go to church here. And then there's another thing the devil does. The next thing the devil will try to do is weaken your faith. If he can't keep you from hearing it, if he can't keep you from acting on it, then he'll do things to try to weaken your faith. And the way he does that is um, he tries to convince you or contaminate your faith somehow that it won't work or get you fearful, fearful, or worse, make you doubt. And he does that through delay. If a prayer is not manifested immediately, he'll work on that. He'll work on that. He'll try to distract you away from your faith stand. Or he'll try to deceive you to believe somebody else or something else that somebody else is saying. Sometimes the worst enemy you've got is another Christian telling you why it won't work. Vessels of the devil. My, my, my. Or he'll try to get you into unforgiveness, get you offended. Because see, when you're offended, your mind is on anything but the word. It's getting back. Or self-centeredness on how I've been so mistreated. I've had people say, well, I'll pray for you, but you just don't understand what they did. How can I forgive them after they did this? Same way Jesus did you that stupid stuff you did. <laughs> Moving right along. But see, he'll try to get you into unforgiveness. And the reason he does that, because every one of these things will weaken your faith, you see. See, things like these will weaken your inner man. You know, the inner man of the heart that Paul talks about. And when that happens, you'll begin to, inf you'll, you'll begin to feel inferior. And, it, and if you let it go on, you'll begin to feel like you're unworthy. Which is emphasis on sin consciousness. And you'll forget the righteousness consciousness where God said that you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You'll forget about that and you'll start thinking about all the imperfections that you have. And, and, that's, and, and you can spend a lot of time thinking about that because we're imperfect in a lot of ways. And the devil will emphasize that. When he sees you acting on your faith, he's going to come against you and oppose you. Yeah. Amen. <clears throat> and when you feel inferior, your inner man gets sick. That's the way he showed me. Guilt, shame, fear, all bring inferiority, and it's a disease on your spirit, against your spirit. And, and, but see, if you'll toughen your faith up, nobody can stop you. Look at somebody and say, you've got to toughen your faith up. See, there's, a, there's a, a spirit going through the nation right now of tolerance. Tolerate everybody. They just decide to be what they want to be. If a man decides today he wants to be a woman, you just tolerate. I mean, after all, he's a free moral agent. They'll use the word to try to justify this stuff. If one of these guys goes in the bathroom, when my granddaughter's in the bathroom, there's going to be trouble in Walmart. And I may go to jail, but I can post bail. No, you don't tolerate sin. And you don't tolerate these types of things. And this political toleration is there 
to do nothing more than to get you to consider these things and it will weaken your faith so that you'll begin to tolerate sickness. You'll begin to tolerate unforgiveness. You'll begin to tolerate these things that the Bible tells us not to tolerate. See, the Bible says you don't tolerate homosexuality. You don't tolerate it. I love the homosexual. I'll minister to the homosexual. I won't reject the homosexual, but I will not try to justify the sin that's in his life or her life. There's a difference. Amen. And that toleration will come in and it'll weaken your faith. <clears throat> if you grab hold of that thing and that's what it's designed in the world right now to do. It's ultimately coming against the people of God. <clears throat> I've had people criticize me because I speak out about such things. Well, one of the reasons it's so big is we have just looked the other way and tolerated it and said, well, you know, to say anything about it is just not love. Hmm. <clears throat> to not say anything about it is not love. You have to speak out. See, you're the voice of God in the earth. If people don't know what's right and wrong, because the, out there now, they think everything's right, everything's wrong, just whatever. You know, just do what you want to do. Everything will be fine, but that's not true. And the first thing you do when you get somebody like that saved, you got to teach all that out of them so that they can build their faith up. Amen. Well, I've gone on a rabbit trail, and I see some people kind of moving around uncomfortable in here, so I'll move on along to something else. So uh, guilt and shame and fear and inferiority is a disease on your spirit, but if you toughen your faith, nobody can stop you. And Ephesians 6.13 tells us, <coughs> excuse me, uh, I'll just kind of paraphrase the Amplified. It says, uh, it tells us that tough faith is in you. Or let me put it this way. Tough faith is you being aware of and wearing God's armor. Let me just put it that way. That's tough faith. Putting, being aware of the armor of God, and you can go in Ephesians 6 and read about it, being aware of it and wearing it. See, to wear the armor of God is to use it. Amen. You need to go and read and re remind yourself what it is, and uh, I'll just kind of blow it by you here in a minute, uh, so that you can resist, and the Bible says in the Amplified there, stand your ground on the evil day of danger, and having done all the crisis demands to stand firmly in your place. See, to be successful as Christians walking by faith, we have to do whatever it takes to stand and not lose. I'm not talking about being mean to people. I'm not talking about that because people aren't your enemy. The devil's your enemy. That's who I'm talking about. The devil is your enemy. Amen. Does everybody know that? That it's the devil that's your enemy and not your next door neighbor that's saying ugly things about you? <laughs> Amen. So he says, tough faith in you is your awareness of wearing the armor of God and resisting and standing your ground, having done all the crisis demands to stand firmly in your place. Well, how do you do that? How do you stand firmly in your place? How, how do you stand and and do whatever the crisis demands. Well, I'll just paraphrase, paraphrase the armor of God. You can stand firmly because you know the truth. That's one of the pieces. You know what the truth is. See, the reason a lot of people out in the world, a lot of Christians, there's, there's, you know, there's, there's thousands of people that come together every morning in what you know, I refer to as seeker-friendly churches. They don't hear this. They don't hear this. They get a kind of a sweet hoopla, but when it comes down to fighting the fight of faith, they don't know how to do it. I know, because I have them call me. 
And I wonder, well, why don't you just come here and you won't have to call me? You just come and hear it. But, you know, they're not there yet. You stand in your place because you know you're righteous. Most of the body of Christ does not know that, that they're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. They're still going by the, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. You were a sinner. You got saved by grace. But you, you are now the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You can't be a sinner and the righteousness of God at the same time. You got to get rid of that sinner consciousness and take on the righteousness consciousness so that you believe what the word says and you can go out and operate in it. Amen. Amen. Access the ability of God, the blessings of God, the favor of God. And you can stand because you know that you're anointed. You have that peace of nothing missing, lacking, or broken. That's, that, that's, that's a piece of the armor. Yeah. And you can stand because you know your faith is on the job. You have that shield of faith. It'll quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. That's what it says in there. And you'll stand successfully because you know you're saved. It would amaze you the Christians or, or people you think are Christians and, and you'll ask them, uh, oh, did, did you get saved? Well, I, I hope I did. When did you get saved? Well, I don't remember. I remember the moment I got saved. And if you don't remember the moment you got saved, you, better, you, you might want to go take care of that. Because I know how I was the moment before I got saved, and I know what happened the moment after I got saved. They weren't anything alike. One was bad, and the other one was wonderful. Amen. But I know I'm saved. So I know I qualify for the blessing. But you've got to know that. You've got to wear that. And you know the Word. The sword of the Spirit. That you can stand when you know the word. And then it says, praying with all spiritual prayer. I'm baptizing the Holy Ghost and I pray in tongues. When I can't figure it out in my natural understanding and can't somehow draw it up because of the pressure against me, I just I pray in tongues as long as it takes for that to come up out of my most holy faith part of my spirit and get on the job. So see, if you know what you have available to you as a believer and you wear it like armor, the devil can't defeat you. It says in 1 John 5, 18, he can't even touch you. He can't get a grip on you because you're surrounded by that. Amen. Is anybody getting anything out of this at all? You're established and immovable and un undefeatable when you know these things. This is tough, aggressive faith. And it's, it's time right now in this season and in this age, you got to get that way to survive. And see, God doesn't want you to just survive. He wants you to thrive. Amen. And so when, when you got that out there, God's at work. Because see, he does the works. It allows him to get involved in your situation and let him do it. And you just praise him and thank him and go on about your way. You've applied the word. You're believing it. You're wearing the armor. God's going to take care of it. See, when the devil opens his big mouth, and he will, everybody know that? I'm not prophesying it. I'm just saying that he does. 1 Peter 5, 9 says, withstanding, be firm in faith against his onset. Rooted, established, strong, immovable, and determined. Verse 10 goes on to say in verse Peter 5, And the God of all grace, who imparts all blessing and favor, will himself. Did you get that? It's not a sign to delegated. Will himself complete and make you what you ought to be, establish, ground you securely, and strengthen and settle you. I was reading that and meditating on that just recently, and that word settle you, 
that phrase, settle you, just jumped out at me. And I'd never really looked at it closely before. And I went on to some other stuff and it kept coming back, settle you, settle you. Well, I've learned that when, when it jumps out at me like that, God's wanting me to look at something because he wants to show me something that I didn't know about that. That word settle, settles you. It means, now listen to this, it says that God will himself complete and make you what you ought to be, establish and ground you securely and strengthen and settle you. The word settle there scripturally means to place in a permanent condition after wandering or fluctuation. To establish and confirm you to make you able to make a stand. See, God spoke of Jesus in 1 Chronicles 17, 14. You might want to make a note of this and go look at it. He said, but I will settle him in my house and in my kingdom forever, and his throne shall be established forevermore. And when the Lord showed me that, I said, okay, what is the key word there? Well, I know what settle means. The other key word is throne. So I looked that up. It means seat of honor, royal dignity, and authority and power. Well, what did he say about us? Basically the same thing in Ephesians 2, 6. He said, and he raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places. That's a seat of honor, royal dignity, authority, and power. You see that? He raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places. See, you're supposed to be free by now. Amen. Amen. You're, you're supposed to have taken charge by now. Didn't get as many amens on that one. You're supposed to be healed by now. You're supposed to be rich by now. Amen. You're supposed to be delivered by now. Amen. But you've got to get started acting on all this. Amen. Like you believe it. Yes. Amen. You have to start talking. Look in the mirror in the morning and tell yourself, I'm rich. I'm rich. You tell other Christians that, they say, ah, that's just, a, that's just, Self-centeredness. I don't want to be rich. I do. Now, I don't go in need of anything. At my age now, my kids ask me, said, Dad, what, what do you want for Christmas? For the family to come over? <laughs> that's, all, that's all I want. I don't need anything. Would I like to have some stuff? Oh, yeah, there's a, I got a long list of stuff I'd like to have. But what do I need? I don't need anything. You know why? Because I believe this stuff. And I talk it. I talk to myself in the morning. I get up in the morning, I look in the mirror. <coughs> Excuse me. And I tell myself, I'm healed. I'm healed. I'm rich. I'm doing well. Have my little private time, you know, that I get with the Lord. And I'll be in my study sitting there and I start telling him. He says, come let us reason together and tell me what I have said about you. That's what he said over there in Isaiah 45. Tell me what I've said about you. Don't tell him how things are if they're not good. He wants you, he wants you to tell him what he has said about you so he can enforce what he has said about you. But he cannot do it until you... Say it by faith so you can access into his ability. And then he'll do it. Why? Well, I, I don't. That's complicated. No, it's not complicated. But it's the way that the heavenly system works. That way, the ones that don't believe it can't access it. Amen or oh me. It depends on what side of the fence you're on there. 
But you've got to start acting on all this. You do, individually. How long have I been teaching this? 30, 30 years? I mean, you know, probably longer than that, but we organized the church in 1988, so that's about 30 years, 30, going on 31 years. So it's time to take the reins yourself and run with it. Amen. If you've been going to church here three months, two months, three months, you've heard enough to start operating in this 100-fold. Yeah, you have. If <laughs> you've gone off and meditated on it and gone back over it, if you've took notes, if you took notes, if you've gone back over your notes. Some people take notes and on the next time they open the notebooks when they take more notes. You just go go back and open your notes up. I go, see, I, I'm, I'm up with the old school. I don't put it on the tablet yet. I too, I got tablets. I could put it on all that. But I've got... Uh, I'm on my 92nd book of sermons that I put together. I like to write it out. I have gone places where I've taught off of a tablet, but I, I like to write it out. And then once in a while, I'll just go in my library where I've got all these notebooks filed from the very beginning of the ministry in 1988, and I'll just reach in there and I'll pull a notebook out. And I'll start on the first page and I just preach to myself. It's good stuff in there, man. I just preach to myself. I don't have a lack of anything to encourage me with. I encourage myself with what I encourage you with. And when I grab hold of it or refurbish it, retoughen my faith in an area, then things start working better. See, things don't work perfect for me all the time. I have to go and retoughen my faith. I have to go and renew my mind of some stuff that is in there that I just let lay, lay there and get packed down and, you know, not use. I got a lot in there, but you got to use it. You got to use it or you'll lose it. You'll lose awareness of it. Amen. Are you with me? So exercise your faith. And I'll just say it like this. Ex begin to exercise your faith like you used to. Now don't look at me funny. I know I'm telling the truth. Exercise your faith like you used to. You remember when you first found out about faith and, and, you, and you'd come and, and uh, uh, take notes and just uh, not sit in the chair, sit on the edge of the chair. And then gradually you kind of scooted back over time, scooted back, and then you're leaning back. And you take an occasional note, and you say, well, I'll get the CD, and you don't, or you might. And you lose the zeal. You lose the fire. And before you know it, you look around, and things kind of look like they were before I got saved. Then the devil said, that's because you ain't really saved, and he'll work on you. No, you have, to, you have to keep this stuff fired up all the time. Amen. Can you understand that? Some of you have quit doing this. Put your checkbook out on the table and declare, you got plenty of money in there for everything that I need and for every good work that God wants me to do. I declare money in my checkbook and lay your hand on the thing, talk to it. Now, some of you used to do that, but you quit. Because now you're spiritually mature and you don't have to do that anymore. No. You've gone dumb. Or somebody's told you, well, that's foolishness. And you believe what a man will say out there that's not, maybe not even saved. And so you quit doing stuff like that. Or some of you need to, again, do what you used to do. Lay your bills out on the table. Lay your hands on them and call them paid. I declare these bills paid in the name of Jesus. When they bring me stuff in here that we're coming a little bit short financially of taking care of the church, I take it and I hold it up to the Lord and say, Lord, you got bills. You got bills. This is your place. This is your business. You got bills. We had a 
situation just recently where, and you know, I, when the church gets attacked, that means you're being attacked. We understand that. And we needed 60, how much was it? Six, we needed $6,600 that week and the Wednesday night service was coming up. Now I know most of the time, not as many people come on Wednesday night as come on Sunday morning. I haven't really figured out why, but that's the way it is. But we needed that in the Wednesday night. No, it was that Sunday, by Sunday. And so we just got, got in faith with each other. And we put it out there before the Lord. And uh, we just said, okay, we thank you, that's done. And that Sunday was not the best attendance we had had. But the offering was 6,600 and something. What was it? It was over 6,600. <laughs> in the natural, it was an attendance that'd bring about maybe $2,500 in for that Sunday. 6,600 and plus. Say with me, God is more than enough. But see, here's the thing about it. He does that all the time. He does that all the time. He does it in our personal finances. But you have to start doing some of the things that you used to do, fire up your faith, toughen up your faith, and, and quit being wimpy about things and folding and rolling over when the devil starts yelling at you. He's defeated. He is defeated. He can't win over you. Si, you may run into some things down at the Citadel that will discourage you. Because I'm sure you realize that ministry down there is not really a norm. I know. I know guys that have gone down there that are my age that went to the Citadel and I hear stories that have become Christians. And somebody may come and... No, let me just be truthful. Somebody's going to come and, and, and discourage you. Don't blink. Because God has placed you there you will be successful. You will prosper. You'll get people saved. You'll get these guys. See, you got believers that are going to the Citadel that one of the reasons they didn't especially want to go to the Citadel because, man, I'm, I'm, I'm jumping into the fire here. Well, you got, you got somebody there with fire in them. Amen. And just keep, keep doing it. Keep preaching it. And if saying, and something comes along and says, well, we're going to shut this down. You just go in your prayer closet, you know, and smile as you go in there and close the door. God, they are not going to shut this down. Get it settled and then come out, straighten up, and go out there and do what you do. That's just one example. It could be that way in your work, as a teacher, in ministry, anything. But you do these things that we've been talking about this morning and it's nothing. And it'll become such a norm and way of life for you that you just, you don't think of living any other way. That's the point God wants to get you to. Amen. Declare the word over everything. Did you hear that? Declare it over everything. Pastor, I used to do that. Well, start back. Who talked you out of it? Was it the devil or that best friend? You need to get a new best friend. Hallelujah. If your best friend has been saying that, you need to get a word friend. Somebody that will encourage you. And agree with you when you speak the impossible. That's who I want hanging around me. When I speak the impossible. And it'd be easy and, and um, accurate in the natural to say, yeah, that is impossible. But see, God is the God of the impossible. If we could do it ourselves, we wouldn't need him. Amen. And he's always going to assign you something impossible to do. So get used to it. Because he wants to show off on your behalf. Amen. 
Look, look, we've gone a little bit over, but look at Proverbs 4. We'll close with that. I want to show you something. I just thought of something over here. Proverbs chapter 4. Talking about the inner man. And verse uh, 23. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it springs the issues of life. Listen to the Amplified. Keep and guard your heart with all vigilance and above all that you guard it. For out of it, out of your heart, flow the springs of life. Well, how do you guard your heart? With your mouth. With your mouth. You guard it with your mouth. It goes on to tell you, next verse, put away from you a deceitful mouth and put perverse lips far from you. See, perverse perversion to God is anything that doesn't agree with what he said. That's perversion. Keep your inner man healthy. That's where your faith comes from. Down in here. And faith releases God's ability, his favor, the blessing, the grace of God, all that synonymous in together. Your faith will release that. And understand, it's available. It's all available. It's not something you've got to come up with. It's not something you have got to create. If something needs to create it, he will create it for you. You may get to the point, I don't know, you're about to graduate, so you'll pass the wand to somebody else, hopefully. But there may be a department that they wouldn't even think of creating down there, but God can create a department. He can create a department of ministry and make it put in the, the, the permanent records of the citadel. <laughs> Amen. Because, see, that's a stronghold down there. It's a military stronghold. Good school. But military have a tendency to kind of be tough, you know, in the natural. But the, the most powerful man in the military knows God. And he can keep his men alive on the battlefield. Yeah, come on up. See, he can keep, see now, I, I got him stirred up. I got him stirred up. You had to take that mic right there. Yeah, so... Uh... One time... You're late. It took me... See, that's the reason I went over. I've been trying to get you stirred up. It just took this long. <laughs> you got me stirred up. You did. But okay. I remember one time there was a... It was called Leadership Day. And this is the day at the Citadel where we go out and do things in the community. But when, like, when they was... When they, at the end of Leadership Day, there was a big meeting. This had the school president in it. It had the provost. It had everybody. But... What the problem was is they took Soar's room. And I'm like, as Soar leader, we had a colonel coming in to speak. I was like, man, whew, we got to get this room. You know, this is where we do it. We have the, our stuff lined up. We have our smart board to play music and everything. And I walked in, and they were like, yeah, we're having this big meeting. And I was like, oh, man. But like you said, you know, Christ will shift the hearts of leadership. And when I walked in there, they said, sir, we're just going to have to find another place for you. But Christ said no. You're in the greater issues room for a reason because this is a greater issue. That Christ needs to be the front of this school. Amen. So I walked in there and and then, you know, we ended up talking. They were like, well, you know, we talked around a little bit and we're going to move upstairs for you. Amen. So I was like, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. Amen. And then not only with that adversity was, you know, getting the room, they had a full banquet in the back full of food for everybody to eat. So we had our food that was brought, but also we had tons of more food available for everybody in the cadets. And then, and, and not even with that, the people that were, you know, in SOAR, like the cadets were feeling the spirit, and it was a great movement. But also the staff that was cleaning up the area was like, man, and I had them praising and worshiping in the back. So, and they were grown people that they were just, you know, they were like, you know, I see this, thank you. So through that adversity, through that, Christ will shift the hearts and make sure that his will be done and not the will of man. So I just want to encourage y'all with that. Amen. 
Having done all the crisis demands, stand. The Bible says that God will change the heart of, clean, of kings. He will change the heart of kings. So it doesn't matter how many stripes they have or how many achievements are on their breast. Uh, it's not higher than God. Amen. 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 But see, he showed respect and he went to Jesus with it. And Jesus, who is the commander in chief <laughs> of commander in chiefs, said, I'll take care of it. Because he put his faith out there. <clears throat> Amen. I've seen that happen time and time and time and time again to those that believe. I could tell you, I mean, it just reminded me of a bunch of stories, so let's stand up. We're going to be dismissed. It doesn't end. We just kind of quit till we come together again. I want you to say with me, I am, I am the righteousness of God, righteousness of God in, Christ Jesus. in Christ Jesus. I have the faith of God faith dwelling, of God. In, me dwelling in me because the Word of God word dwells, dwells, in me. dwells in me. So I purpose in my heart Right now, now, to speak the word word concerning any need, need, any situation, any any occurrence that I need to happen happen in my favor. favor. Because I have God's ability, ability, His grace, grace, and His favor, and and the blessing blessing that Jesus obtained for me on the cross cross, available to me right now. I access all of that by my faith, through my faith, with my faith, by speaking what God has said. And I thank you for it, Lord, that I have that authority. In Jesus' name, amen. Can you give the Lord a shout of praise? Hallelujah. Hallelujah.